Hey guys, Toby Mathis here, and today we're gonna to go over six myths about living trusts in probate. And so we're gonna just dive right in. You like my high tech signs? This is how we roll. Number one, myth number one, and this is the one that's most common. In fact, when I first became an attorney 27 years ago, this was the one that I'd always get met with. And that is that living trusts were only for the wealthy. And I can't think of anything that's more misguided. In fact, it's way more critical for folks that are of limited means or have families to please, please, please have an estate plan, financial power of attorney, healthcare power uh, directive, uh, HIPAA release is already in place, schedule of gifts, the things that are important to your family, because a little bit of probate and a little bit of legal uh, dispute in a smaller family could have devastating results, whereas really, really wealthy people, sometimes they fight, all, I'm thinking of one case that uh, one of our attorneys uh, was involved in, it was $8 million estate and they spent about $1.5 million of legal fees on it. Well, at the end of the day, they still have six and a half million dollars these people were fighting over. If it's a small estate and it's a hundred thousand dollar estate and there's sentimental items, it's literally gone. You end up doing any sort of litigation for any period of time, that money is gone, no inheritance. I've seen it because it happened in my family, so I happen to know exactly how important this thing is. What a living trust does is it avoids having to go through the probate process in its entirety. And I'm going to say in its entirety because there's a few more myths we want to debunk. Myth number two is that wills avoid probate. Wills do not avoid probate. In fact, they require probate. They are the opposite. So whenever you see these billboards, $99 will, what they're saying is pay me to do a will and I'm going to wait for you to die and I'll get paid when you die because I'll probate your estate. And AARP did a very comprehensive study of regular estates. And it ends up, it's about 20% of a typical estate gets eaten up in the probate costs. So here's an attorney who knows, hey, here's a family, they're worth a million bucks. I know I'm gonna get a big piece of that. I know that I'm gonna get it. And you're gonna say, oh, it's never that high. Come on, Toby, that's just crazy. Like, go look at uh, California where it's statutory fees and you're looking at actual 8%, you know, depending on how big your estate is, it's a percentage for both the attorney and the personal representative. You could be looking at a sizable amount, six month tie out, plus all the other expenses that go along with it. Yeah, 20% is about right that we see, and it's time consuming. But a will absolutely requires probate. Anybody that's telling you differently is being dishonest. You have three choices, three choices. You ready? Do nothing, you die intestate, you're prince, right? You're gonna see years of litigation over any, any sizable estate, or you have to go to court and they're gonna have to give a court order as to who gets what. Number two is a will. A will, you go in front of a judge and it, they have written instructions as to who gets it, so they're not just following the state statute. They're following your direction, which is contained in that will, but it requires probate. Number three is a living trust. Living trust does not require probate. It avoids probate if it is fully funded. And that's gonna be one of our next things, which is myth number three, which is a living trust always avoids probate. No, a living trust, if you set it up, you sign it and that's all you do, you're still gonna be probating. But a good living trust has something called a pour over will, which is a will where the living trust is the sole beneficiary. In other words, we don't have to go through all the rigmarole of all these notifications to all these potential beneficiaries and go through a huge process, you could actually do it fairly quickly and privately and it's still fairly private. Like again, a will is a public record. All of your assets are shown there when you are using just a will. When we're using a living trust, the living trust is a private transaction. The world doesn't get to know everything that you have. If you do not fully fund your living trust and you use that pour over will, that portion would still be public, but it's just the living trust that's receiving it. In fact, we don't have a whole bunch of heirs popping up saying, hey, I'm entitled to something because the, 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 the will is very clear that it's only the living trust that's the beneficiary. So a living trust does not by itself, hey, I just signed one, magically I don't get to go to probate. No, you gotta fund it with things like your house, your assets, your checking account, your entities, you gotta make sure that they are in that living trust. If you don't know, make sure you contact somebody and that they're doing assignments of your interest, putting, deeding over properties, 
making sure that it's in that living trust. And this is where it really gets critical, especially for you real estate investors out there. You have to probate in each state where you own real estate if it's in your individual name. So if you own real estate in, let's say that, hey, I live in Nevada and I have a house here, I have a house in California and I have a house in Georgia. If those are in my name and I pass away, I am probating in Nevada, California, and Georgia. I'm having to go into each jurisdiction and start a whole new action, which is a pain in the katush. Living trust and or using other entities. I could use land trusts, I could use LLCs. I just need to make sure that it's not me that's, that's sitting there holding it. I need to make sure if I want to avoid probate, that cannot be sitting in my name when I pass away. So that living trust does not always avoid probate. Number four, myth. Living trusts are complicated and expensive. Not anymore, guys. It used to be that a living trust, statistically, you're always looking around 10 grand to 15 grand. When I first got started, it was not uncommon to see those prices. They have gone down 70, 80%, right? It's gotten pushed down to where it is very competitive. You can, if you do work with groups like us, we allow unlimited, we call them unlimited uh, living trusts, where we allow unlimited amendments, so you're never gonna pay again. You're gonna pay one cost, and then if you wanna amend it every year, you get to amend it every year. It's covered. All you have to do is make sure that you have it in place. But we do not, it, I always look at it like this. People have this perception that things, these things are for the wealthy and that they're complex. It's a very simple, document that for people who have been doing it for years, like myself for 27 years, I know what should be in there. We already know 90% of it before you walk in based off of your facts and circumstances. And then we're just tailoring it to you. It's not rocket science. Once it's in place, you don't have to go and redo it. There's no filing fees that you have to pay. It's none of that stuff. It's actually fantastic estate planning. And it's not just for when you pass, it's for when you're alive as well because we have our power of attorneys for healthcare, power of attorneys for medical. We wanna make sure that somebody is there for you. If you have minor children, please, please, please make sure that you have guardianship provisions for those children in case something happens to you so that you're not forcing your kids to go through some struggle. Or if you have elderly parents, make sure that they have some sort of estate plan so that you can step in and act on their behalf if they're not able to act on their behalf. Myth number five is that probate is always a nightmare. A small probate actually can be fairly easy. If it's simple, if I could do it via affidavits, if I could do it without having to notify a whole bunch of people, probates don't have to be that ugly. Where probates are ugly is when you start having siblings get involved and one of them feels that their feelings are hurt, which is very, very common. Like I would say the vast majority is because there are children that either harboring resentment or guilt. For example, mom is, you know, mom gets older, one sibling is there with mom for the last five years of her life, the other two, maybe there's three siblings and two of them weren't anywhere near, they were in different states and, and then mom leaves a little something extra to the sibling that was there and then they resent, they feel embarrassed, they know that they weren't there for mom so they want to attack that sibling and they say undue influence or whatever, that's the recipe for most disputes is having those kids. We can avoid that entirely by drafting up that living trust and also putting teeth into it. You wanna contest this thing, you're disinherited, right? If you're making frivolous claims, you're done. If you're just wasting people's time, you're done, right? So you can actually put those provisions into that trust, keep it away from court, and then make sure that you're able to nip these things in the bud. But a simple probate, a low asset probate, for example, hey, all I got is a car, I gotta put it in there. I got a, a checking account that has you know, 10,000 bucks in it. It's not difficult. What is difficult is when you have the entirety of the estate and then you have all these beneficiaries potentially floating around out there. And even worse is it's all a public record. We do not want that. I, I value my privacy. My clients value their privacy. The only question is, do you value your privacy? Because if you do, then a living trust is the way to go. Number six, you lose control of assets when you put them into a living trust. That is a myth. You are still the trustee of your assets while you are alive. It's basically, use the example of a, a roll-on luggage, right? We have, our, we have our clothing, but I don't wanna carry my clothing in my arms. Like if I'm getting on an airplane, I probably wanna pack it into luggage. And that's what we're doing. It's basically like a roll-on. I have my entities in there. 
I have my assets in there, I have my checking account in there, my house is in there, and it's a roll on. And so long as I'm able to could carry that roll on, and I have the, the, my faculties are okay and I can still do this, I am in control of that roll on. I could, I could take anything out of it I want. I can revoke it if I want. That's how much power I have when I set up a living trust. I'm not giving up control of anything. Where I do have control, even after I pass, is let's say that I pass away and I can no longer roll that roll on. It now has instructions for when somebody opens it up and takes things out of it and says, here's when you do it. Maybe you wanna make sure that your kids are of a certain age before they get access to certain assets or sizable amounts, or you believe in legacy planning and you really just wanna make sure there's a safety net for your future generations. Then your instructions to your trustee are gonna be very, very different than if you were somebody who just says, nah, just give it to my kids, right? I'm, I would never advise you to do that, by the way. Even no matter how great your kids are, you're just kicking the can down the road because then it's gonna to go to their kids and their kids. We don't know what's gonna happen in the future. If you wanna create a legacy, then you're very deliberate about who gets to go in and get what. You know? And again, you can incentivize certain things like travel. Maybe you want them to be an entrepreneur, so you do matching funds. Maybe you want them to invest in real estate, so you do matching funds or whatever. Or they're able to actually work with the trustee and even invest inside the trust that's gonna benefit future generations. All those things, very easy to do inside of a living trust. But what I want you to walk away with is there is a myth that somehow you're losing control. No, you have way more control. In fact, you have control from the grave even after you've passed to make sure that your legacy is cemented through the use of that living trust. So they're an absolutely essential tool. Let me go through those three things. They're not just for the wealthy. I'll use this one example. If you've ever had like ADP or ADT or one of these alarm places come over to your house and you call them up and you say, I'd like an alarm for my house. And they walk through your house and they look around and they go, you know, you should probably start leaving your door open. You, you got some heinous furniture in here. Maybe somebody will steal it and do you a favor. They don't do that, right? They look at your house and they go, all right, where do you want the alarm? Like they value you. When you go into an attorney and they say, oh, no, no, no. Estate planning is for the wealthy. You're not big enough. They're telling you that your furniture sucks. You sh it doesn't matter anymore. Like the, it's, it's a misnomer. It's, it's absolutely outdated. Living trust, you, anybody can benefit from a living trust because it's covering you during your lifetime, your health, your finances, and the way that your estate is treated. I don't care how big that is estate is, it's still worthwhile because it takes the burden off of the future generations and off of your heirs. So number one was that living trusts were just, they're not just for the wealthy, they're for everybody. Number two is a will does not avoid probate. That's a myth. Wills do not avoid probate. Wills are a grease slide into probate. Number three, living trusts aren't as complicated or as expensive as you might think. Living trusts are not that complicated. They're actually fairly straightforward, easy. They're just a document. You sign it, you've done contracts. I would argue that your cell phone contract is probably more uh, difficult than your living trust. Uh, the number five is probate isn't always a nightmare. The myth is that probate is this absolute dumpster fire every single time. No, probate of your entire estate more often than not can have problems. And it's expensive and it's time consuming and we can avoid it. But probate in and of itself for small estates, small, just moving an item, it's, it's not to be run away from. It's not that difficult when you don't have a bunch of beneficiaries that are fighting. And then the last myth is that you lose control when you put items into a living trust. No, you don't. You still have complete control during your lifetime of a living trust. Hence, they're called a living trust. They're inter vivos trust. However you want to term it, you are in control during your lifetime and you are in control even after you pass. And that's how you create a legacy. If you have any comments, put them down below. If you want me to cover a new topic in a different video, put it down below. Uh, and if you can, like and subscribe. And by all means, share this with anybody who you think could benefit from this information.